Idolatry is putting, essentially, uh, putting second things first. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it, it's not just wrong to do that, but that when you put first things first, the second things are good. But when you put second things first, you, just, you don't only commit ad- uh, idolatry, but you spoil the second things for yourself. And so we're told, 1 John 5.21, the last verse of 1 John, it's almost a startling statement that it seems like almost out of the blue. It, it ends with this. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Well, are idols something that we face today? Well, if an idol is anything we put above God, is there anything that we sometimes put above God? Yes. And I think we do that for one implicit reason. We put other things before God because we think, we imagine, that we will find greater happiness in the other things than can be found in loving God, knowing God, walking with God, and obeying God. That's precisely what tempts us. What makes sin attractive to us is that Satan takes this rat poison and he he wraps it up in this beautiful, bright, shiny, colorful wrapper. And it's just going to make us so happy. Hey, it's rat poison. Sin doesn't bring ultimate happiness. Tim Keller uh, says this, sin isn't only doing bad things, it's making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. Go, go back to um, Augustine who, who said this. This is the happy life, to rejoice to thee, of thee, for thee. For they who think there is another pursue some other and not the true joy. So when we see God as he really is, God as primary and his creation as secondary, then we can look at his creation with the right perspective. Is it right that people would go out and look up at the stars and think of the wonder of the universe and that their hearts would be moved to awe and wonder? You know, when you go and and stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon, are you doing that because you think so much of yourself and that the real fulfillment in life is just thinking of how great and mighty and big you are? No, the wonder you're feeling is how really, really small you are and how really big this is, and this doesn't even begin to get to what really big is. If you look at the universe and you look at valleys on the planet Mars that uh, 10 Grand Canyons could fit into, and then you think of what exists in the universe that in places we've never been and perhaps we'll be able to go in the new heavens and the new earth, when we look at the secondary that God has made and we enjoy the barbecue, um, is, is God happy for you to enjoy a D's hamburger? I, I left out the French fries, okay. But I, I'm, no, yes, yeah, so or French fries too, but whatever. As a diabetic, the milkshake's probably a little bit out of my league, but. Sweet potato fries. Uh, yeah, right. Or go over to Theta's to have her pie and, uh, or whatever it is. But. Can God take delight in that? Do you know how many references to eating and drinking there are in Scripture? It's stunning. Do you know how many times Jesus promised us we would sit down and eat and drink together in his kingdom? They'll come from the east and the west and sit at the table to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we'll feast together. We can take delight in the secondary things as long as we see that God is the primary. And as Augustine was saying, we get into trouble when we think that these other joys are greater than God. God isn't the only joy, but he's the ultimate joy. And he's the one that gives us joy through the secondary. And we see this in Jeremiah 2, uh, where this is a great passage. I think it captures the essence of idolatry and it has great relevance to the subject of happiness. 
He says, for my people have committed two evils. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So they've turned from me, the primary. Second, they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, other sources of water. I'm not going to go with God, who's the fountain of living waters. I'm going to turn over here to the water. Well, where does all water come from in the first place? Well, of course, it comes from God. But we're turning from the primary to the secondary. And we're going to take this other water and these other containers of water, hewed out cisterns for themselves, but the problem with these cisterns is they're broken. They can hold no water. There's enough water that you can get a little bit of the quenching of thirst, a little bit of the happiness that God, in, out of his um, general revelation and common grace, gives to all people. He sends the, the sun to rise and the good and the evil and the rain to fall on the good and on the evil. But the ultimate satisfaction of our hearts, we thirst after him. And Jesus said, let anyone who thirsts come on to me and drink. And that's our problem with these idols, these secondary things. It's not simply wrong to go after the idols. It's, it's stupid. It's senseless. It doesn't work. They give us just a taste of happiness and pleasure, but it's temporary, and it does not satisfy us deep in the heart and soul. So Jesus says, if you thirst, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you ever thought about that invitation? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Find Search for your happiness in God. He gives us a thousand reasons to be happy, most of them revealed in his word that tells us, tell us what Christ has done for us. But then when we see through those eyes, we will see every day full of the kindness of God. 